Make Your Peace Podcast is the Winona Herb fan podcast that digs deep into every episode, not only providing comprehensive recaps, but also delving into character relationships and motivations. Hosts Catherine and Laura take their time exploring all the nooks and crannies of each action-packed episode, puzzling over and speculating on moments you may have missed. If you enjoy a good discussion of your favorite sci-fi show, then this podcast is definitely for you. You can find Make Your Peace podcast on Twitter at 4YE underscore MYP podcast, where you will find links to their latest episodes. Make Your Peace podcast. Dig a little deeper. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Make Your Peace, a 4YE podcast about Winona Earp. I'm Catherine Mushaw. And I'm Laura Hayes. And this week we'll be discussing season three, episode two, When You Call My Name. And as per usual, before we get into it, uh, we want to say a quick thank you to all of our listeners and for everybody who's given feedback and everybody who shares and everything. We really appreciate you. So thank you. Oh, also before I forget, because I forgot to do it at the beginning of the episode last time, we are leading, if you noticed for the first time, maybe we have a ad from the, um, it's starting in the beginning of the podcast now. We had it in the uh, the end and used it as a placeholder, but now I'm actually remembering to mention it, so it'll be in the beginning. <laughs> so uh, shout out to the ladies at uh, Art Fiction Addiction Podcast who made that for us. And I didn't want to forget that and almost forgot to put it in my notes. So thanks, guys. <laughs> and with that, Laura, do you have a quick recap for the uh, episode? I do. The demon who cursed the herb heir reveals himself in a shocking turn of events that will leave the team forever changed. Alrighty, and how about that title? So the title for this episode comes from kind of who knows where. I found results for Garland Jeffries, Paul Brandt, and an artist known only as Cheryl. And I vote that we give it to Cheryl for having the courage to stand on just that one name. I'm with that. All right. Um, and I know normally I like to ask you, hey, where do you want to start? But considering how that episode ended, I think we should probably uh, talk about the doll stuff, right? Right here in the beginning, talk about dolls' death. I think you're right. So um, do, do you want to start or would you like me to? I can, I can start. All right. I think... Yeah, I think it's I think you're right and I think it's only right to start this discussion about uh, dolls. I've got a lot of friends who were hurt by this exit and I've had to close Twitter quite a few times in in the last few days and here's what I truly do not understand. How is it helpful to a fan who's mourning the loss of their favorite character to say, well, this was his decision. What does right. that solve? And, and better yet, what kind of a constructive conversation can we foster with such a dismissive approach? I don't think you can. No. And I, I think when you, I think you shut yourself off to that fan when you tell them, well, this was his choice. And for the record, you guys, Shamir said he wanted to go out a hero. Shamir also said he didn't know how he was dying until the table read, and that's in the TV Guide interview. Also, Shamir didn't write this episode. And also for the record, not all heroes have to die. But anyway, mm -hmm. the, the queer fandom community was dealt two really painful fake-out deaths with Samin Shaw on Person of Interest and Delphine Cormier on Orphan Black. Those two hit me really hard. They were both presumed dead, both walked knowingly into their own demise, heroically. It was their choice. And you know what didn't make me feel better, Catherine? What, what didn't make me feel better was to have people link me to interviews with Sarah Shahi talking about how she wanted Samin Shaw to go out in a blaze of glory. It didn't make me feel better when Tatiana Maslany openly criticized fans in an interview 
when she said that queer fandom was being reductive in saying that Delphine Cormier shouldn't die heroically because she was gay. None of that helped me cope with the loss of the representation that I was starving for. Mm -hmm. None of it. And what, what did help me was venting my frustrations openly on Twitter. Yeah. It was, it was reading articles that talked about why these deaths were so painful. It was it, Tumblr and fan fiction fix-its. Those things mm -hmm. helped me. Yeah. My mutuals sharing my pain and commiserating a loss with me helped. Listening helped. And being heard helped. Mm -hmm. Feeling like I was allowed to be angry helped. I was still watching. I just wanted to be mad about it. Yeah. So that's, that's what I have to say on this. And I'll say more about the actual death and the way that it was written a little later on. But for now, I'm begging you, erpers, especially white erpers, please just listen and please be as quick to defend the people among you who are hurting as you are to defend the cast and crew. Thank you. Um, and I, thanks Laura. I think, I think yours um, was a, a good tone to start off with because surprisingly I'm a little bit more critical. <laughs> I'm a little bit more, more nitpicky. And you know, anybody listening to the podcast, especially last week's episode knows I busted out with quite a few disclaimers before I spoke and after I spoke when I was critiquing the show. I'm not doing that today. Except to say this. Laura and I are both white women. We are speaking as queer white women, and I feel like I need to mention that because what we want to make sure we do is elevate the voices of um, the people of color who are speaking. So one of the things I, I do want to ask, you know, if, if you if you have something to say and aren't feeling heard, you let us know on the podcast Twitter and we'll retweet you. We'll, we'll do what we can and we'll retweet from our personal if we if we haven't managed to, to get to you because we want to make sure to, to amplify the, the voices of the people who are really affected by this. And I, I know it, it's kind of, it's one of those things it's, you know, as a queer white woman, I'm really appalled by my fellow queer white women and how they have responded. And I think that's fair. I mean, I think you agree with me as well. Right, Laura? I mean. Yeah, I would just like to see more listening overall. Yeah. And also now is probably a good time to point out that uh, during the hiatus, Laura and I put together a round table discussing representation and we asked a handful of um I think they were all, yeah, it's all women of color, but we asked a, a handful of women of color who are all fans of the show to talk about the representation. Um, so I'll make sure to retweet that on the, the podcast Twitter just really quick uh, when we're done. So that way you guys can check that out if you haven't, because it's in, it, it's a good read and I think it's still a little bit relevant. Um, some of the some of the topics are, are still really relevant um, and they kind of indicate that this is quite a, a decent problem. All right, now that that's out of the way, I wrote out a very lengthy thing discussing representation and all that stuff. So bear with me, folks. <laughs> and also as a to reiterate, just as a note to, to my fellow fans, my fellow erpers, I'd like you to ask yourself why, if this is the nicest, most inclusive fandom, people are afraid to criticize plot points and are afraid to tag the show. Why a lot of these conversations are either happening with people who don't care about getting a couple of people in their mentions or are used to it because they want to speak out, or why a lot of these conversations are happening in DMs. I, I do want to also ask you that question and, and really ask you to, to ask yourselves that question. So this show has a representation problem when it comes to people of color. The show is super white and when there is a person of color introduced, they are either quickly killed off, evil, betray the group, or don't get much of a storyline or a combination of them all, <laughs> of all those things. 
And fans of color deserve better representation, and they most certainly deserve their voices to be heard instead of silenced by fans. And a lot of this is kind of an echo of what Laura said, but we actually put together our statement separately. So, <laughs> it happens. Since Friday, I've seen a number of white fans, including a number of queer women, deciding to step in and attempt to silence criticism from people of color who were upset by what happened. And many of the arguments I've seen are a lot of the same arguments straight fans use every time queer fans discuss a, a queer character being killed and, and the barrier gaze trope. It's a, it's a lot of the same language, a lot of the same arguments. What happened with, with dolls is the latest in a list of negative tropes that characters of color have been victims of in this show and on a broader scale in TV in general, especially with sci-fi. People of color deserve positive representation and what happens was a harmful and painful trope. Also, you know, it's the, the point isn't, you know, oh, Shamir wanted to leave or, oh, Dol he wanted dolls to go out a hero. The point is, once again, it was a trope that he didn't need to go out this way. And I think there are ways to go out like a, I mean, there are, like you said, there are ways to go out a hero without something like this. Yeah. I also, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but you don't go looking for bigger and better opportunities if the one that you have is treating you right. And maybe that's the worst way, that's not a good way to word it, but my point is, yes, he wanted to leave, but, you know, Dolls didn't have a great storyline. So, <laughs> I would want to leave too. You know, I would want to go pursue bigger things. And also, this attitude that at least it wasn't way hot, so going with the, the queer uh, fans who have spoken out, you know, at least it wasn't way hot, or as long as they don't kill off the gays, isn't okay. Because our rep isn't the only valid representation. And just because a show is good with one type of rep, like with queer rep, it doesn't mean it doesn't lack in other areas. That's true. Yeah. And, you know, we can't be afraid to criticize media, especially when it's something you love. I get wanting to be in a nice, happy bubble and just enjoy the things that make you happy because the world is crap. I get that. I get that a lot. But other people should get that opportunity, too. And they should be yeah. able to enjoy it without people telling them to shut up and deal with it. So, um, yeah, I fully believe Dolls as a character deserve better. And it doesn't surprise me at all that Shamir was looking for other opportunities, like I said. Dolls was a flat character who wasn't given much of a story and was the awkward third in a love triangle. You know how I feel about that love triangle. Yeah, I mean, the show did not... I've made it clear. Yeah, the show didn't necessarily do right by him. And I guess the one last bit of thing here, as far as kind of what I... Uh, just a reminder that allyship is about amplifying the voices of that minority group, the people who don't have privilege. So, you know, straight allies amplify queer allies. White allies amplify voices of people of color. It's not about coddling the people whose voices are already heard. So I'd like for you guys to keep that in mind too. You know, everyone's an adult here. They they don't need you rushing to your to their defense and to in and in your rush a lot of times people trample over the people who really need a voice. I think that was the bulk of what I had to say. <laughs> that was the bulk of what I had written out. I feel like there's a lot more to say. I do yeah. also, you know, I, I saw a number of conversations on Twitter from people of color who were discussing their frustration and the fact that they have been silenced previously in the fandom and that they don't feel like they belong in the fandom. So just a note to anybody listening, you know, who may find that surprising or just something worth no noting and everything. But yeah, I just... This was really disappointing. This was a really disappointing thing that, that happened in the show, and I'm I'm upset for for what happened here. Like I, I just it it sucks. Oh, um, also, if somebody had hyped up the episode, like if the the hype leading up to this episode, if somebody did that when a queer person died fandom would be out for blood. 
So again, just, well, they just, did. <laughs> it happened with Lexa. No, I know. <laughs> yeah, it totally happened. I mean, Le and we were. <laughs> Lexa was a much grander scale. Um, but yeah, even yeah. even the yeah. hype that happened leading up to this episode with the, what people are talking about San Diego Comic Con and stuff like that, there was a lot of, you know, this episode's a game changer. Um, you know, I love and hate this episode. That's fine. But I mean, it felt like this episode was being hyped up considerably, and that's also a problem. So, like I said, just some casual, friendly reminders. Because I, I don't really, I'm sorry if it was abrasive, but I don't care about being nice about this. So I, I owe it to Respect. my friends to, to speak up. So that's what I'm going to do. Now I'm done. Said your piece. For now. I haven't made my piece with it, though. So um, now, that, now that we've gotten the, um, the, the, big, the big stuff out of the way... <laughs> really really big stuff we should we should probably get talking about the episode um other aspects of the episode not that that wasn't important because the the obnoxious thing about this episode was i actually there were pieces of it i actually liked yes that's i was having that conversation with you yeah i um we were texting about it and i feel the same way i i was like man you know like that's that's the hard part is that I have, you know, I have these feelings about dolls and, you know, the way that he was written off and, you know, other parts of this episode, like, really tickled me, you know, like, some things I thought were really good, so, but, you know, a lot of people are saying that too, and I think that that's really important, um, uh, there was a terrific article, you guys, written, it just went up today, I think, in the Mary Sue. It was by Princess Weeks. And, you know, she's talking about how, you know, you can have problems with something and you can still love the mm -hmm. thing, you know, or still like certain yeah. parts of the thing. And I think, you know what, I'm sorry to keep doing this, but <laughs> I think that's one more, that, that's one more point that I would like to make is that you can do both. I can look at the, I wrote, we, we, we've written out notes for an entire podcast around this, you guys. So like I can, you can have a problem with, you know, one aspect of a show or the way one character was handled and still love other parts of the show. This isn't a, a, a you know, like a cut and dry thing. It's not all or nothing. So keep that in mind, too, when people are voicing their frustrations to you. That doesn't mean I'm never going to watch again. That doesn't mean I'm going to organize a boycott against this show. It doesn't mean any of those things. Yeah, I mean, it's just... Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know. Not being... There's this idea that puts about in fandom, the idea that criticism is hate or something. And it's it's not. I don't yeah. waste my energy on stuff that I really don't like. Well, word, right? I say that, but I've spent a long time to. Never mind. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna name drop the show. But yeah, I mean, it, it's it's not. Like we've said, criticism. We want it to be better. And if nobody points out the problems that a show is having, or the problems in a movie, or something like that, the problems in a book, they just keep going, and nothing gets better. Yeah. Nothing changes if nobody speaks up. And it doesn't help if we don't listen to the people speaking up. Mm -hmm. And if we don't help to elevate those voices. See, I we... stepped all over your transition. <laughs> you bitch! Oh, I'm, I'm just so kidding. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I did. I was just like, oh, one more point. <laughs> I know, no, no, it's okay. I think it'll happen a lot. All right, all right. I think now it's out of our system. Not that it's any less important. Okay. I'm not trying to downplay the importance of our discussion that we just had. I'm just saying um, we wanted to have it first because it was so important. So we're going to go ahead and get into talking about the episode. And don't worry, y'all. I still have some nitpicky things to talk about. So <laughs> <laughs> in true form. <laughs> you wouldn't be you otherwise. I really wouldn't be. I, I dig it. Yep, yep. And I, like I said, I'm sure we'll we'll come up with um with, with more to say. And like I said, I'll probably be we'll retweet people who want to be retweeted and stuff like that as long as you're not like a raging dick or something. So <laughs> now I stepped over my own transition. So where do we want to start our discussion of the episode? Well, okay, our 
where, where do we want to continue our discussion of the episode? <laughs> I I want to start with hallucination, Mom. Yes, because I I love the I love her, the way she criticizes Winona's dress or her frock, as she calls it. I talked about this a little bit on Twitter. I was uh, live tweeting this uh, episode. Mm-hmm. And just the thought that you could, like, literally be staring your death in the face and your mother would still be displeased with your ensemble just cracked yeah. me up. And um, the one thing I did want to say about hallucinatory Michelle, as I called her in my notes, I really, I really dug that. There were a lot of moments that I like. And it was a really nice glimpse into... Winona's kind of thinking and, and psyche and everything. Mm, mm-hmm. And um, I saw a couple of people like suggesting that maybe in some way she was actually there. And honestly, mm-hmm. that suggestion to me completely cheapens the importance of what she represented there for us. Mm. So I did, I, I wanted to mention that because it, it was a really interesting, I mean, it, it was a really interesting way to present Winona getting her out of a situation, especially with everything that she's been dealing with. Yeah, I I totally agree with you. And I actually loved Hallucination Mom, which is what I'm going to keep calling her, uh, for that very reason. I loved and appreciated her as Winona's inner saboteur, kind of. Um, or, you know, just like her, uh, self-criticism, which is how I, I took it. In fact, I thought there was one really, like, dis, well, there were two, but I'll start off with this one that I thought was just, like, cut and dry. This is a projection of, you know, like, her self-criticism speaking to her. And that was right near the beginning when... I, I just I thought it said so much about Winona's view of her own drinking when she takes a swig of that rest, uh, whiskey bottle from the the wrecked truck, and hallucination mom says you really are your father's daughter. Yeah, definitely. And just it's the interesting thing about um, since I'm thinking about it because this was one of the times that I noticed it, and I think it's the only time it happens. So. Winona and Michelle are kind of kneeled down at the truck and she takes that Mm -hmm. swig and then Michelle asks, you know, they hear the the noise and then Michelle's like, what if it's Bolshar? There's something really interesting happening there because they, they mirror each other's movements. Like, I think Winona puts her hand up to her face in some way or like brushes her hair back or something like that. There's a movement there that Michelle does as well. And I kind of really like that. I just thought it was kind of a cool, cool thing that happened. So I wanted to just like really quickly note that because because it was kind of a, a really interesting thing. Yeah, I totally miss that. Watch it a third time, you'll probably catch it. <laughs> there we go. It literally took three watches to do. So, and it was, I mean, there was a lot about, you know, hallucinatory Michelle that was really interesting, like, you know, calling Winona a Gibson and Winona insisting that she's not. And, you know, you really have to sit and think about, you know, like the comparisons to her mom. And you really have to kind of think about what is it that Winona associates with being a Gibson and why she clings to the Earp. You know, mm-hmm. the Earp name gives her purpose, gives her meaning. And the Gibson name gives her a mother with a mental illness that actually affected yeah. her because she had to take care of her. You know? Yeah. Um, it's like that there's that level of like shame with it that Winona is kind of experiencing as well. So let's just stay on hallucination, mom, because I love this train. So she is a whole section okay. of my notes. Like she's I have... a whole section. I know <laughs> I've got like one more after I get done saying what I'm about to say, there's just a whole separate one, but like Waverly and Winona have always been the heart of this show. Yes. So it really, like, struck a chord with me that Hallucination Mom used the possibility of Waverly dying to force Winona to snap that shoulder back into socket and scurry back up that cliff. Like, despite the fact that Winona was literally facing her own death, 
it was the thought yeah. of Waverly in jeopardy that galvanized her and gave her the strength to save herself. And even, you know, like, don't go rushing after Waverly because they're hours ahead. It gave Winona not only another push to be like, I have to go get her, but to stop and go, wait a minute, take inventory of what I have. And, you know, as a reminder to get up, a, get a damn jacket, you know, mm -hmm, and she mm -hmm. picked up a tire iron. So it's just, it was, it was a fun tool. And here's the thing that kind of pisses me off about Hallucinatory and Michelle. Stay with okay. me here. All right. This was such a good thing in this episode. And it's a little frustrating because it was Dolls' last episode. But it was such a, like, that we didn't get more with Dolls. Like, that was the frustrating aspect of it. Like, so much time was spent on, you know, Winona and Hallucinatory Michelle and stuff like that. or And, like, Rescuing Waverly that we really didn't get much of a, a, a Dolls in this episode. So it's like, that was the obnoxious flip side of this. It's like, okay, it's Dolls' last episode. It's like, I would have liked to get some answer, something. I would have liked to get something more here. You know? Okay, I'm going to step away from hallucination, Mom, briefly. And... I know, I keep going back to dolls. I'm going to... I'm No, I'm going to jump on what you said. So, Jeremy asking dolls about the night sweats and their entire interaction before dolls leaves to go find Doc mm -hmm. hints that there have been symptoms of Dolls' condition for a while. Yeah. Likewise, Jeremy is edgy. He's talking about secrets, which means this is something that he's had to sit with. Yeah. And what the show is asking us to accept is that whatever testing or symptoms Dolls has experienced and shared with Jeremy all happened off camera. Yep. And my problem with that is my problem with Nicole and Waverly pitching up their entire relationship off camera, patching up. Yeah. Last season, Dahl spent a fair amount of time on his back, out of commission, while the team strived to find a serum to help him control his power. Yeah. It was like it was like eating away at him. And supposedly we did. Yeah. We found a solution. Dolls went like full dragon at the end of the season, and we cheered, thinking our hero was not only saved, but he had leveled up significantly. It was in our season two wrap-up, Catherine. We brought it up in the roundtable that you're going to be tweeting out again. We were excited to see where this would go. And now, two episodes into season three, we find out through a truncated conversation that the work that was done nearly all of last season to save him didn't work. And in yeah. the very same episode, the same episode that that information is barely given to us, Dolls dies. And that's my problem with how it was written. <laughs> also, I'm really, really worried. I am, I'm sorry to pull us out of the hallucinatory Michelle train because I had so many more notes, but I, I just... I know, that was fun. Um, uh, another aspect with that, I am really concerned that in some way, if they ever bring Rosita back, because Rosita was their solution. Rosita, re like, Rosita was the, the connection there who helped them redo the serum, to make the serum. Mm -hmm. I am really worried that... Oh, no, I know where you're going with this. I know. I really don't want this to become, like, a weird way for Winona to get angry and blame Rosita because she had recreated the serum last season. Ugh. I know, I'm sorry. I had to say it because my brain went there and it would really make me mad because yeah. they really did Rosita wrong last season. I know. And if she were to I ever come back. I hope that doesn't happen. I know. I'm really concerned that we're going to have some a lot of misplaced anger and blame because... You no, know, this, I get it, I get it, yeah. We, we don't know, we we have no knowledge of what it was that made Dolls and like, because they focused on the serum, like, twice, and it's, like, with Jeremy yeah. looking on it, and with Dolls, and, like, they were tweaking it last episode, um, like, Jeremy was tweaking it last episode, and, um, you know, it, it's, like, okay, is it one of those things where it's, like, it, if he takes it one more time, he's gonna die? 
Right. And my mind yeah. immediately went, went to when you give Mama Murphy too many chems in Fallout 4. That was oh, a special wow. place for my mind to go. <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> well, no, if you do, because she Throwback. Just, I know, she just right up. Well, oh, okay, that's not as much of a throwback as, like, Buffy, or as our numerous Buffy references. But, yeah, I mean, it's just, like, I am a little worried about that. Yeah. God, I hope that doesn't happen. I'm sorry. I had to say it. I'm sorry. I had to no, I get it. You're right. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. I, yeah, I get why you went there. Ugh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it would just, and that's another, speaking of representation, that was another problem with how Rosita was treated. Sing it. Sing it out. I'm really sorry, everybody. <laughs> I don't think we should keep in our singing. Oh, I'm going to keep it. It definitely stays in. It it definitely, anytime that happens, it stays in. As long as it's relevant. But yeah, back back to uh, Hallucinatory Michelle, because I know we both had some notes, but uh, as per usual, we kind of deviated a little bit, but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's on brand. I think so. So hallucination mom is also like the pandora's box that is winona's abandonment issues <laughs> yeah so like and i love that because i have a ton of abandonment issues so anytime a character does i like recognize it and i'm like oh that's what that you're messed up because of this i got it so like telling her the moment she relies on someone she's dead Asking her where all her friends are when she's been missing for hours. She even throws Alice in Winona's face, uh-huh. which is amazing, right? Because this is Winona throwing Alice into Winona's face. Epic. Yeah. But, yeah, so she, she throws the baby in her face, and you know, to tell her that they're the same. And, so, I mean, so she's basically, you know, like, it's Winona telling Winona that Winona has abandoned her child as mm-hmm. she was abandoned by her own mother. And I, like, I got done watching that scene, and I was like, I want to put in a request to draft that vampire psychologist Buffy killed in season seven after her, like, crypt therapy session. Because I think Winona, I think Winona needs to talk to someone. Speaking of Buffy, I do appreciate a good Buffy parallel, as you know. And, like, Winona basically telling herself, that, you know, being the heiress made her soft because she's leading on her team of misfits and, you know, fighting mm-hmm, back with, mm-hmm. no, it actually makes me stronger. Kind of a Buffy thing with, you know, when the yeah, Watchers was. Council was like, we're our friends. And she's like, no, thank you. I believe that was the Watchers. See, I backed myself into a corner and there may have been a Buffy. No, 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 no. So. You're right. Because right. it was okay. season, yeah, it was season five. It was Glory. Yep. And so they, they came in town to tell her that she was a god. But first they put her through all those paces, all those stupid yep. things. But, I mean, a lot of thing with Buffy is, and even it was, like, in season two when Kendra comes in, it's like, you have all these people who are, you know, like, helping who know and stuff like that. And, you know, it goes against the handbook that she didn't even get, that Buffy didn't even get, because Giles was like, no, yeah, you're not getting that. (laughs) All those footnotes. I know. Anyway, that's before I go on a Buffy train. I mean, it was such an interesting way for Winona to kind of tap into some of her own abandonment issues and everything. And I do... I do want Winona to make sure she gets thoroughly checked out at the hospital because she most likely has some sort of head trauma with how she was thrown off that cliff. I'm not even going to address how she was thrown off that cliff and magically onto that nice... I'm not even... Nope, I'm not going to go there. I did find it interesting, too, um, a a little kind of, I guess, a a bit of that abandonment and Winona really feeling, you know, I think it's a little bit of middle child syndrome as well. Mm -hmm. Um, There was that bit about, you know, Michelle telling Winona... Um, that, you know, Willow was Ward's from the beginning. Waverly yeah. was everyone's. And then Winona came into the world just like she did. And I, I just thought that was really interesting. It's like, um, you know, that that view of it too. It's like everybody had somebody except except Winona. Oh, Winona. Now I'm just depressed. Wanna, I just want to give her a big hug. I know, me too. This was a rough one. Mm-hmm. Can I talk about the Revenant of the Week? No, we're not talking about the Revenant of the Week. Please. Nope, 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 nope. There's another Buffy reference in it. Ugh, I guess. No, yeah, All great right, court, cool. dude. <laughs> All right. Okay, so, like, I just, I want to say real fast that I love the Trapper using stolen voices to lure or confuse or isolate prey. 
I thought that was so awesome. It's like hyenas, which we even, you know, we did, we saw on Buffy in season one with the hyena people and everything, like calling through the window, like Willow, like all that stuff. Like, yeah. but I, as hunters, right? I'm getting so excited. I'm like not making sense. Anyway, so like hyenas, like as hunters, they mimic and do they hunters, really do that? Like, yeah, yeah, they can like they. Well, yeah, like it, it sounds like crying or like. uh uh, things like that, like the, you've heard the sounds they make, right? Like on the Discovery yep. Channel? Anyway, mm -hmm. birds do, or uh, not birds, cats do it to birds. They'll like mimic bird calls and stuff. And mm -hmm. hunters, human hunters, right? Use duck calls and the like. Yeah. They camouflage themselves. So I just, I thought this was such a neat trick to give a demonic apex predator who like traps and hunts his prey. Like it was just, it was kind of brilliant. Yeah, it was. I'm thinking about it. Yeah. I just was wrapped up in gross cannibalism. Again. Again. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to talk a little bit. Well, yeah, I had another thing on that. So, like, so briefly, I'm going to give you, like, part of a different note. I think we can say that he was, like, a cannibal, like, sort of an opportunistic cannibal, right? Yeah. Because, like, the, the woods were clearing out and stuff. So mm -hmm. he started trapping people instead. Yeah. So a little different, but he was still a cannibal, so I get it. Yeah, I mean, he does mention, you know, he has a, this is the second episode in a row we've had kind of references to the forest being weird. Uh -huh. And again, as I mentioned, um, last episode in the yarn texts, they mention, you know, there's something weird in the woods. So this is just another thing. It's like the forest is changing. You know, he was telling her that the trees pulled up their roots, so apparently mm -hmm. purgatory has ends now. Um, <laughs> you know, the trees are on the move. He's getting lost in the woods. The animals are gone because, you know, they're scared, and his traps have been empty for months. So, yeah, I mean, he is kind of an opportunist, and we know that Bolshar has been risen for months. Um, and the, the symbol of the cult of Bolshar is on one of the trees that Winona and her mother walk past. Yeah, you're touching on, like, two of my notes right now. So that's, like, okay. I'm just going to so, stomp on all over your notes. I'm just going to be yeah, I'm like, using it. Like, wait, wait, um, so, yeah, so he's, yeah, so the trapper, like, started trapping and eating people instead because the trees were scattering and the animals were scattering. And I thought that that was a neat layer to add to Bolshar, because, like, we've seen it a lot of times in, like, movies and TV. Like, you see, like, animals running scared or there'll just be, like, a shot of a deer. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it turns toward the camera and runs off and, like, stuff like that. But, I, yeah, I thought that that was just a cool layer to add yeah. to it. That, like, the animals can sense that something is wrong and they're, like, all pulling out. So it's almost like <laughs> Bullshar seems to be Catherine. <laughs> what? You. <laughs> It's anyway, <laughs> but Bolshar seems to be, like, making some kind of, like, a dead zone within Purgatory, and I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, and literally, like, it's a cell dead zone, too. Again, yarn texts, uh, there's a few instances where it's, like, we find out that there's, a like, a cell dead zone, so dead zones oh, on go. multiple levels. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a tool in fantasy a lot, um, in fantasy and sci-fi, um, the idea, yes. like you mentioned, it's, you know you get closer to the the villain's lair, whatever, um, by noting that trees are dead or animals are no longer, like, there's no noise and stuff like that. So it's, it's, yes. it's a tool that is frequently used. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for the inappropriate laughter. <laughs> you. <laughs> but um, I want to, um, can we talk about that symbol real fast? Yes. Okay, so... The symbol that we keep seeing, like, Bolshar's, like, cult symbol, at least, mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's a symbol, right? We think it's a symbol? I, I'm assuming, because it's I'm it assuming all the cult so of Bolshar stuff, so if it's not, right. I'm very confused. But we see it uh, in a photo on Jeremy's desk, and then, like you said, mm -hmm. we see it again carved in a tree while Winona is walking through the woods, like, looking for Waverly. And the first picture seems to be a picture of a carving, too. And so I'm just wondering if, like, if that's real, if the trees are literally, like, uprooting themselves or, like, moving, I wonder if they're trying to get away from the symbol. 
Maybe. It's being like carved into them, you know? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, I there's a lot of season left and uh I yeah, have that's no true. idea where it's gonna go. So it's kind of it, it, that that's possible. I like that theory. It's a it's a good theory. So well, I don't I know, think... I haven't <laughs> I would <laughs> hope so. It kind of sucks when you don't like your own theory. Right? It's a downer here, for sure. Um, oh, another note about Creepy Revenant. Sorry, guys, yes. we're, like, all over the place, but I think that happens a lot. We're just more so than, than usual, so. I am not here for Revenants at Steel Voices. That was creepy and disturbing, and I didn't like it. I mean, it's really good, but by the same token, like, watching Waverly try to scream and, like, can't and stuff like that, it was very upsetting. I mean, I feel you. Like, I think that made my list of favorite moments as one of my least favorite. One of. Like, the Trapper, like, phone calling, like, telling Nicole, like, not to worry, and then that, just that awful like silent scream but yeah. just let's never let's never do that again like it turns out that like the only thing that is like i just i didn't know that like how can i okay so like waverly being dragged through the snow on a sled of her own blood was less upsetting than Waverly silently screaming in a cage. Like, who knew that could happen? Yeah, that, that sounds about right. <laughs> yep, it was it was not okay. Not okay one bit. Ah, I missed a hallucinatory Michelle note. Sorry, guys. Cover it. I know. I did just like Michelle, you know, telling Winona that she, she did listen and, and taught herself everything. Um, but because it was a nice little moment too, where Winona can have like that, you know, I took care of myself and I did listen and stuff like I, you know, stuff like that. So I did like that moment. I wanted to mention that as well. I mean, again, yeah, it's it upsetting good. as hell, but it all is. I just want to hug the Earp sisters. So what about some of your other favorite moments? Okay. I just love the mental image of a tiny Winona dreaming of the day she'll get to see Hanson in concert. <laughs> Because she's so moody, you know, that, like, just, I don't know, imagining her, like, not able to stop singing Mbop is fantastic. I did also appreciate the Mbop reference in there. Yeah, that was really good. I, I, I liked, as per usual, there was a lot of, like, little things that I liked. Um, like, once again, with Hallucinatory Michelle. I liked her just kind of sitting and chilling on the cliff, like, leg hanging down. Like, I can be here all yeah. day, it's fine. <laughs> And that Winona's first thought was Waverly and making sure Waverly knew was that she was okay. I cannot reiterate how much I love the Earp sisters, so I'm just going to bring that up again. Because I love them. Mm -hmm. The charades moment was a, a lovely moment in, um, in the episode. <laughs> don't, die, don't Die Charades is <laughs> the perfect game for all your high-stakes parties. Long live the breast alligator. <laughs> I... Truly thought, um, I think a couple of the people have mentioned this. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time in like whiskey and donuts uh, after this episode because I was trying to write a recap, which you can check out if you look at the Twitter account. But somebody mentioned, I thought that she was like trying to like mime the wire. Like when Winona first went to Underwire, I was like, oh, she's doing really good because I really thought she was trying to like talk about the wire and not say booby trap. <laughs> But yeah, I, I enjoyed the, the charades. I enjoyed moments of levity like that. I really do. Yeah, so do I. I also like the darker fair, and I got a kick out of the helper huntsman or the would-be rescuer who stepped in and then was immediately decapitated by the trap wire. Like, that was that poor dude's sorry. son, Laura. I'm sorry, but it was really funny. To me, maybe me only. But again, like, we got to, you know, like, the Trapper was using Waverly's distressed voice. Mm -hmm. You know, like, he's like an unflattering depiction of a siren. Yep. That's about right. Uh, you're not wrong there. 
But no, that poor guy's son had to die just so that Waverly knew there was a wire there and why why Nona didn't get garroted. We're um I we are not uh going to agree. I thought it was delightful. I guess if there is like one thing that we had to disagree about in this episode, I think I'm okay with it being that one thing. It was probably bodily harm, yeah, to some rando. <laughs> Because on the plus side, at least I have a good good feeling that most of the fandom will be with me on that one and just look at you a lot differently now, so. Well, I mean, then what were <laughs> they for the body part count that I, I just abandoned? That is true, and we did get an arm this episode. We did. So. I'm just staying true to myself, Catherine. That's all I, I can do. It's okay. You're a twisted weirdo, but I love you anyway. Thank you. <laughs> That means a lot. I'm glad, I'm glad. Um, so, favorite moments, other than the incredibly upsetting garroting of the random dude. Okay. <laughs> I liked Winona tricking the Rev and getting him in the hole, and then immediately being caught up in the snare. God, that was so funny. Mm-hmm. And just her, like, that whole, like... She just kept it going for so long, like, just having some me time, you know? <laughs> yeah. and, like, <laughs> and even Doc, like, afterwards, like, are you done yet? You know, like, can you admit that you need help? Like, <laughs> Yeah, I I really enjoyed that. Um, <laughs> it was so good. Yeah, just Doc is, you, you good? <laughs> so. And I Nicole, like, picking up that, like, bloody Shaw and talking about how Waverly would would be cold is oh. that was beautifully yeah that was beautifully delivered uh, Caporell did a phenomenal job uh, with that moment um, so not a not necessarily a happy favorite moment but I thought that that was moving yeah it was and um, I think I had that in my favorite quotes so I think that's where I put that note because especially like I kept thinking throughout that whole damn episode how cold it was filming. Because it was winter. They were filming in winter. Yeah. That's cold. It's Canada. Yeah. That's no joke, man. No. Um, but yeah, just, just Nicole. I love Nicole. So just, just her, you know. Waverly, she'll be cold. With, I mean, that didn't even look like it was that big of a scarf either. It's like, okay, I'm pretty sure it wasn't going to help her that much. But I really kind of love that Doc knows when, um, Jeremy's crap night is. Yeah. And it makes me wonder, like, if Jeremy ever, like, tried to get Doc to go with him. Or, I'm sure he has. I'm sure he has at least once tried to get Doc and the gang to go to craft night with him. Yeah. Like, most definitely. And it seems like, if he remembered the date, that, like, Doc has been at least once. Maybe. Like, that's what I'm thinking. Seems like, like it. Maybe he was just, like, didn't have anything to do that night, or, like, really just wanted to humor Jeremy or something. I don't mm -hmm. know. It's I'm just saying it's a really strong possibility. I agree with you. It's a really strong possibility that Doc's been to, to, to Croft Night. Oh, I guess we should probably mention, since sometimes we have a bad habit of mentioning, of forgetting to mention this, Nicole's uniform. Nicole got a new uniform shirt. Mm -hmm. It's a button-down. I actually like it a lot better than season two's shirt. Yeah, I think she looks like a cop. But yeah. Like, a cop with a very well-tailored, like, dress blues. Like, or yeah. blues or what else. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the button-down feels very, it feels more copy. I didn't like the zipper. I do like her commitment to not doing the top buttons and stuff like that. <laughs> So I feel like, but I know we got to mention it because sometimes we forget and then have to like have an oopsie moment in the, in the, in the podcast. So we have to mention Nicole's outfits. One other thing I did notice is why Nana doesn't have her necklace or why Nana didn't have her necklace. And I don't think she had it last episode either. Uh-huh. Well, last episode it got brought back to her, right? That was season two. No, didn't we start... Season three, like in, oh my god, oh yes, okay, yeah, sorry, it totally was. You guys, we've been trying to catch up on our, yeah, go ahead. Anybody who's following along with the podcast already knows why I went there, I'm not going to explain it. And if you don't, then, oh well. Uh, no, yeah, I just wanted, I just thought that was noteworthy. She is not, she was not wearing her necklace. 
And I'm assuming, you know, I don't remember her wearing it before the formal wear part of last episode, but she is yeah. definitely not wearing it with the formal wear, so she wasn't wearing it when they went off the cliff. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I wanted to mention that, because I do know how much you like to track the necklace. I do. I like Doc mentioning that heights give him the wheezies, mostly because I just really, really love how that line was delivered. Yeah, his little, like, the little face he made. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I feel that on a deep level, I don't like heights either, so I feel you. I don't either, yeah. They're pretty terrible. And you know what? Like, staying with Doc, I'm going to say it. I thought it was a little, like, almost out of character for Doc to be surprised he went to hell when he died under the, like, Iron Witch's spell. Yeah. Like, Doc knows who Doc is and who Doc was. And this whole time, you know, on the show, he's been, like, fighting to be a better man, right? Yeah. And he's been fighting to be a better man alongside Winona. So in this spell, when she wasn't in purgatory and he and Dolls were enemies and he died, he went to hell. And, like, so what? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's not his reality. And from the character's perspective, that's terrifying, right? I mean, yeah. hell leaves a scar, I'm sure. But... That's not the same man. And and so this whole thing of, like, it's rigged, I can't affect this, is, like, so random to me. Because, like, it, like he, his whole life was literally manipulated by this spell. And all of these recent good deeds did not exist. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I so legitimately... Like, had not thought about it like that. Yeah, like, so like, legitimately had not had that train of thought. I so I couldn't get you. I've I've watched it twice and I couldn't get around it either time. Like I was just like this makes no sense for Doc. Like it it doesn't make sense for him. Other than other than just looking at it and going, well, it was a really traumatic experience. But obviously that's not how I watch TV. So anyhow, <laughs> like I just it's 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 hard to imagine that that entire scene was about anything other than drawing the distinction between who Doc is and who Dolls is. And it's a contrast that was very deliberate, and it makes, like, losing Dolls, like, even harder, like, just for me personally, because mm -hmm. he's a good man, mm -hmm. you know? Like, he, he fights for what's right, He no matter the cost, like, at, at any risk to himself, like... And, and he doesn't do it for the promise of some eternal reward. Yeah. So that's what no, I'm going to yeah, say about it, that. Um, there was a few moments in here that were very deliberately shoehorned in to make it, to remind us who Dolls is and stuff like that. and Or shoehorned in for one reason or another with Dolls. Um, but I honestly, I'm so glad you had that thought because I legitimately hadn't thought about it like that. Like, I legitimately hadn't considered the fact that he's angry about something that, like, happened in this AU that happened because Winona wasn't around, you know, because, you know, so it's like he what yeah, so I just, I hadn't, thank you. He was <laughs> literally, yeah, he was literally a totally different person. He had never yeah. met Winona. He hadn't had this change of heart. So, like, how could he say that it's, that it just, it doesn't make sense. That's no, all. it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, so some of it was weird. But no, I mean, it was very, it was there just because, you know, dolls. But I know that's something that, I mean, if I remember correctly from, like, San Diego Comic-Con interviews, that is something we'll be seeing him deal with, like, all season, is the whole going to hell thing, so. <sighs> Don't worry, there'll be more! Oh, one of the things I did want to mention is it's it's interesting that the Rev is, was afraid of Bolshar. Yes, um, yep. And, you know... Yep. He's gone, and then, you know, he kept repeating, you know, he's gone, he's gone. And then he did say, never to find me again. Uh-huh. So, there's a really, I'm hoping we'll find out more about the Revenants and Bolshar. Um, yes. Because, I mean, he was the sheriff, mm -hmm. but he was also a demon and a corrupt man. So, well, because he was a demon. Sorry, that was... <laughs> 
<sighs> whatever. You're good. You're good. So I did find that interesting that it, at least one of the revenants is is afraid of Bolshar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have, like, a really similar note. Like, because last week, the vampires were all about declaring their fealty. But mm -hmm. this trapper, this this revenant, just, he adds kind of another layer to that mystery, right? Because he's not happy to know that Bolshar's on the loose. And he he was not eager to offer up some tasty sacrifices. Like, he was, he was afraid, like you said. Which suggests that Bolshar may not have allies within the Revenants. At least not with, you know, allies uh, among all of them. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I also, I really hope Winona went back and finished that rev off, considering he was just kind of like, he died, but he wasn't like sent back to hell. He was just chilling at the bottom there. Yeah. And I really hope she went back and finished him off. I have a feeling she didn't because, you know, she got Peacemaker and Dolls died and she's a little distracted, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's not really a rev I really want back out in the world. No, he was not what we would call a contributing member of society. No, not really, no. There's population control, but I think the other revenants in Purgatory take care of that, you know, when they start attacking people and stuff, so. I, I think it's okay. Population think... control. No, I was thinking about the hunting thing. Like... No, no, I know. Was... But he's hunting people. No, so no, it's I know. Funny. That's... <laughs> that's why I said it the way I did. And then when you know when you've got the revs, you know when he starts hunting people, that's what I said. I, I said what I said. <laughs> I, I know. I'm laughing at exactly what you said. I thought it was hilarious. I'm glad you find me funny. I do. Somebody should. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I keep, like, not being able to decide where I want to go next, because I've got a lot of random notes. I guess we should probably mention, uh, Waverly and Winona talking about Michelle. Yeah, that was exactly where I wanted to go next. You are a mind reader. Go. Yay! Winona kind of has to have that conversation with Waverly in two parts, since Waverly can't talk. Mm -hmm. Back during the first one. And I'm kind of... I'm interested to see where they go with this because Winona does tell her, you know, their mom was messed up when she left and they moved her to a new facility before she went to Greece and, and that their mother asked Winona to never tell Waverly where she was. Yeah. Which is understandable. I mean, again, I've talked a little bit about there, there's, unfortunately, with the stigma of mental illness, there comes an element of shame with it. Mm -hmm. um, so that there's a lot of that that's being experienced here, I think. So it's unfortunate, but yeah, Waverly's a uh, Waverly's a little upset, and I think she'll be upset for a while. Okay, so I want to say something about that conversation, but before I do, and not to take away from the the stigma of mental illness, but I think something else that happens, especially in families where there's a lot of pain or you're struggling a lot, like things were really hard when I was growing up, and. Um, I've like frequently like new things th that maybe I shouldn't have known. And I definitely yeah. knew things that my brother did not know. Mm -hmm. And it was this, like, sometimes it was expressly stated and sometimes it wasn't, it was just something that I s sort of intrinsically knew, uh, or picked yeah. up on like from my mother to, um, just, just not mention Mm -hmm. something that she was dealing with or going through um just to keep my little brother smiling to keep him happy you know uh, to keep him not a nervous wreck like i was because and yeah. i i did those things um n not only because i was told or uh, not only you know because that was a secret that i was entrusted with but because i would look at him and he was so different from me, and he was so happy that he was also this, like, untarnished, like, source of joy in my life, mm -hmm. even though I was only four years older than he was. And that was something that I wanted to protect. I wanted to protect this, this source of light in my life. And that was kind of... I'm sorry, you guys, I just got so personal, but that was, um, 
that was what I took away from this. You know, not not to say that it wasn't about the stigma of mental illness or anything like that. I, I think it was a layered uh, moment, and I think it was a, about a lot of things. But for me, uh, that that's what it reminded me of. I am. Um, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I think it's both. I honestly, I think there's an element of the shame there, but I honestly, I, I, I think it's both what you were saying um, when it comes to it's because it's, you want to protect people. Um, and yeah. it's, it's really, it's, you want to protect people. You, you want to protect kind of that innocence and stuff like that. So I, I agree with you. I, I think it is that, that to a level as well. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that mm -hmm. um, because it is anybody with siblings and anybody with, I think understands at least anybody with with younger siblings definitely understands that that need to protect and that need to make sure that they don't have to hear about the crappy thing or whatever you know yeah and it's this thing of like it becomes this thing that like your parents do to you mm -hmm. like parents look at their children and say well so long as they're okay i'm okay and sometimes especially when things are really hard mm -hmm. in families younger siblings can do that too uh, or older siblings can do that too with their younger siblings they can look at them and say no it, it's okay because they're okay and if i can just keep them okay then i can be okay yep yeah it's it, exactly yeah and i just i thought that was really powerful yeah it is i mean there's there's so much here with the ERP family dynamic yeah um you know, there's so many crappy positions that the kids are put in just because of what their parents are dealing with. Yeah. But yeah, there's there's a lot of layers to um, Michelle Gibson's mental illness. There's a lot mm -hmm. of layers to it. Um, and I, I do appreciate... Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I, I, I was just going to say that I really appreciate that the conversation went kind of the way I suspected it would go because I and I, I think it was really believable like I said last episode when we recorded that like Winona will not be thanked for this and she wasn't thanked for it and that's the it, sometimes that's the hard thing when you're like so close to someone uh, and you're used to protecting them or you're used to being in this protector role mm -hmm. and you fail to realize that they're adults now and they can handle and they deserve to know the truth and so i really i just like how i like how that played out uh, between the two of them because i didn't think that waverly was going to be cool with it and oh, no. she wasn't i mean it, and it's really hard sometimes to see your younger siblings as adults yeah it is i mean i've got my my quote little sister who's taller than i am um, but she's three years younger. I mean, she's married and she's pregnant right now. And I'm still like, mm -hmm. my baby sister. And it's like, yeah. I forget that she's an adult, you know? Yeah. My baby just... brother is way bigger and stronger than me. <laughs> he's still my baby brother. Yeah, it just, it happens. It's family dynamics are fun. <laughs> I'm interested to see where that goes. One of the things I thought was weird... And, like, I literally have this in my notes, like, several times. Like, this was weird. This was weird. This was weird. Oh, I think I just answered my own thing. Sorry, I just went through that mental thought process. That's okay. Without, yeah. Um, no, because I was going to say is, you know, because after Waverly walks up to Dolls and asks him to take her up to the car because mm -hmm. she's hurt her ankle or her leg in some way, shape, or form. We're not sure how. I mean, she was dragged by it, so I'm sure that was a contributing factor. We just don't yeah. actually know what, what she did. It could be, like, her, quote, broken arm that was in the tiniest of slings for one episode back in episode, or season one. So, <laughs> Waverly and her, quote, broken wing. <laughs> the tiniest, saddest sling. <laughs> anyway, and I just, I thought that was kind of weird just because Nicole was standing right there. And I thought a lot of Dolls and Waverly's interactions in this episode were weird. Yeah, actually, that really hit me on my second watch. I was like, that's yeah. so weird that Nicole would be standing right there, but she would ask Dolls to walk her back. But then the mental thought process, like, the, the mental journey that I just went through, no, um, was, it might have been, I, 
she had to have known that dolls knew because of how, you know, he kind of pushed her to taking Waverly out, you know, home. Mm -hmm. So Waverly had to have known, like, that at least dolls knew that there was something major to talk about. And maybe it was just one of those things where it's like, she didn't really want to tell Nicole what was going on yet. Um, yeah. And so maybe that makes a, a way, lot of sense. And a way to avoid that was to ask dolls to take her up. So yeah. I literally just had that thought process. It took me three watches and then, you know, an hour and some odd minutes into a conversation for me to get there. But <laughs> yeah, but I, I think you're right. Especially like if she just needs to sit with this information for a yeah. second, like then yeah, Nicole, I mean, Nicole might be somebody that she needs just a little bit of space from in that moment because she knows that she's going to have to tell her all of it. And yeah. she probably just needs a second to get her own head around it. And dolls would be a very safe person in that, mm -hmm. uh, if you're in that mindset. Yeah. But there was a few moments there. It's, and I, I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier where it was like, they were trying too hard. I think at points to be like, you know, um, like there's that, dolls randomly out of the blue telling Waverly that Winona is going to need her more than ever. And I thought that was very weirdly placed. There was a lot of like kind of wonky editing or something happening here because I thought that was very weirdly placed considering the big action hadn't happened yet. Like they were all kind of dialing down. He was, you know, making sure she was okay in the car and stuff like that. You know, Bolshar hadn't shown back up. You know, the rope wasn't cut. None of that had happened when Dolls tells her that. And I thought that was really weird and out of the blue. And that's when Waverly starts to get worried. So, and I mean, yeah. you and we can make the argument, right, that uh, he could feel something like happening inside of him. You know, like we could we could make an, an argument like that. I think that you're right, though. I think we got down to the wire and there was still all this setup to do. Because, yeah. li like, I, like I said before, you know, all of this stuff happened off camera. And then it gets, the fact that there's even a problem gets introduced in this episode. And then in the same episode, he dies. We've just had a huge mom reveal to Waverly. Yeah. And now we've got to face off. We've got to meet our big bad. And we have to face off with his lieutenant. And all of these things are happening. Boom, 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 boom. Right? Like, to knock them out. So I think that the the pacing suffered a little bit, and oh, yeah. the sort of and and I think that that played with the emotions in the episode because it was there was so much. I mean, this could have been this could have been a mid a half season arc. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it was handled in one episode, and so that just was never going to go over smoothly. Yeah. Yeah, and then, like, when they started, when Winona yells for dolls, and dolls, like, shuts the door in Waverly, like, it was weird. It's like, she's not a child. She can open the damn door. Like, it was just a weird, I don't know. It's like a lot of the interactions with dolls was weird, or were weird, and it was just, like, really frustrating. Yeah, I get that. I, I, I think, um, I, yeah, I think there just wasn't really room. Yeah for him to, like, breathe and be in this character and just be in this character. I think he had to be Dolls who's about to die heroically. And he couldn't yeah. just be Dolls. You know what I mean? But, yeah, that's... Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, pacing. I, I mean, I hate to, you know, like, uh, boil it down to its simple... Obviously, we've highlighted a lot of, like, other issues and stuff like that. But, you know... Uh, I think what it comes down to and what is frustrating a lot of people, not only is there a representation problem, not just on this show, but on television, in, in mm. movies, everywhere. Not only yeah. is there a representation problem, but there's, this was, this was abrupt. I don't know yeah. how else to put it. Like, I'm I'm not really worried about putting it nicely. That's not it. I just I do worry that there could be a better word, but that's yeah, like that's the only word that I can really come up with. And I mean, I think people saw me on Twitter like live I I did not believe it. 
I could not believe that that he was actually gone. I was like, this this makes no sense though, because no. like we spent all last season fixing this. It was one of the climaxes of last season, and we're only yeah. two episodes in to season three. You can't kill a main character off this way like you just can't do it i don't believe it and then you started sending me those articles and i was like what like yeah it was abrupt yeah you started mentioning abrupt and my mind immediately went to the end of seeing red so that was a really upsetting place and a thing oh i'm sorry it yeah. wasn't you it was my brain i'm very upset at my brain right now very That's upset amazing. at my brain but now i saw that a number of times especially there were people who were like um, like, I've seen a lot of people talking, like, dolls as a dead theories, and people pointing out that, you know, he can hold his breath and make it seem like he's dead, like he did in episode 8 of season 1. But, you know, I believe he's, I mean, every interview, and even Shamir is supposed to make a statement at some point, um, he, he said he would, he needed some more time, which is understandable. But it's like, he's not gonna be back. At least that's the impression that we were given. And the way this is being treated and, like, they did, like, the cast, apparently one of the iTunes extras is, like, them talking about his exit, which is a little frustrating because anybody who doesn't have the iTunes stuff doesn't get that extra. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I mean, I think he's he's gone. Like, this isn't one of those fake outs. I think this is legit. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've been super faked out in the past, but I also don't want to give people false hope. You know? So it's like, I, I don't know. I mean, for all intents and purposes, he seems pretty dead right now. I, I don't expect him to come back. I would love for him to come back. I really like dolls. And, you know, like I said earlier, I was excited. I was excited. You know, last episode, yeah. we got that we got that cool vampire immunity, you know? He couldn't be enthralled. Yeah. He couldn't be glamored by them, which I think is the word that they were using, glamored. But, um, but I thought that was so neat, you know, I thought that was just like one more little nugget of, you know, like this big mystery of like what he is and what he'll become and where he'll go and what he'll do. And, and it, it's hard to, you know, you, you, you get invested in these, in these people and it, it's hard to see a, a character that had so much potential mm -hmm. just not be realized. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's really the the problem. That's the problem is he was completely underused. He was the character wasn't used like he should have been. He wasn't a fully developed character. And even in the TV Guide interview, you know, Shamir talks about being bummed about you know not being able to get into a storyline more, bummed not being able to see his background or his origins and stuff like that. You know, bummed to not get that relationship with Winona and stuff like that. So, that really stuck out to me. Yeah, it really stuck out to me, too. It was, I felt that way. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it's disappointing, and that's what a lot of, of fans of color are experiencing, mm -hmm. is that disappointment that, once again, it was like, oh, hey, here's a character of color, but we're going to go three seasons into this series and not really get to know this character, going to have him kind of flat and stuff like that, and then he's going to be killed off. Like, that's the frustrating thing. Mm -hmm. and back we're back on that again but it's worth mentioning and um, you know that that mary sue article that i talked about earlier um that i'm going to talk about again and you guys can find that on my uh my private twitter i retweeted it um you know she said something that was like uh what did she say she said like was his death heroic like yes like it's not that he didn't go out fighting for what he believed in. It's right. not like he didn't go out on, you know, like, it's not like that character didn't make a choice. Nobody walked up to that character and shot him with a gun. You know what I mean? Like, nobody's saying that. But it just wasn't, it was too quick for it to be as meaningful or as, as it could have been you know what i mean like if this had been something that we had built up to gradually you know like him like struggling or or 
um, not able to use his power, and then he uses it in this one last burst thing, like at the end of the season to save everybody. You know, like something, something like that would have had more gravitas, and that is, that is only speaking uh, about the death narratively. I, I'm not speaking about um, POC rep right now, you guys, or uh, people of color um, dying to further the story or anything like that. I think you know where I, I stand on that. Um, I, I hope I made that clear. Um, the 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 thing that I think made this so unsettling is it it just he had all this potential and then mm -hmm. he lost it so quickly and. It just wasn't rewarding. It, it it didn't feel rewarding to me in, in any in any way. I mean, not that I typically cheer for heroes that I really like who die, you know. But like, it, it just I, I think that more time could have been could have been yeah. taken. And 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 that's the other thing that that I think keeps really frustrating me on Twitter is like the people of color that I've been listening to and interacting with are not saying, you know, that he went out a coward or, or anything like that. Right. Like they're not saying that, like they're saying he was positive representation and now he's gone. And that's, mm -hmm. I, that's, that's what we need to focus on here. You know? Yeah. I'm definitely. sorry. I feel like I'm rambling now. No, no, you're fine. I think, I mean, we keep coming back to it and I think it's important to keep coming back to it. So no, I mean, it's just, uh, I don't think that was a real written exit. No. And that's the thing. I don't. Yeah. So, and it's just, it's frustrated. That was my unfrustrated voice. So mm -hmm. if you couldn't tell, um, no, I mean, it's just, it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. Um, especially it's frustrating knowing that if it were Nicole, that people would be rioting. Yep. Or if it was, let me, refer, if it was another queer character on a show, like people would be rioting. Like mm -hmm. that's the thing, but there's a big problem in fandom and that's it right there. That's the yep. problem. So we got to get there together. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that bat commando guy, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> is that like, what you called him? <laughs> yeah, I called him Bat Commando. So, like, do we think that, like, he was the one killing the sacrifices for Bolshar? Yes. Because Jeremy, yeah, because Jeremy said that he thought that they all died within seconds, meaning it was something that could move, like, really fast or move yeah. really easily from one place to the next. And so, like, what does that mean for future sacrifices? It, like, does it cheapen it if Bolshar's got to get his own hands dirty? Like, uh, do we do we count super speed among Bolshar's powers? Because he was kind of on that, like, cliff, like, or, you know, that, like, raised, yeah. like, knoll, like, looking at them, and then he was gone. Um, and, like, what did that bat guy mean when he said the earth thirsts for blood? Like, the I earth, have... not, not yeah, Bolshar. Bitch. Um, yeah, like, what was that about? I am wondering, because anybody who knows fantasy and sci-fi, demons, like gods, can kind of be more, like, can kind of, there's more than one option for, I guess, the demon's powers and kind of the domain of the demon. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if his is some kind of earth kind of situation especially with the way we the information we get from like the trees and stuff yeah you know the trees going poof we don't know what happened with the vampire and the weird walnut looking thing mm -hmm. um but like with the trees and and stuff like that so i'm wondering if maybe him saying like the earth thirsts for blood that's that's just his roundabout like bolshar wants a wants to wants blood or whatever yeah you know? so I'm, like I'm to kind of like get at what you're saying so you're saying that like you think his powers are like earth driven like um like bobo has power over metal like you think that's like his focus yeah maybe 
Like okay. a really evil druid. No. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I was going there. I was going there in my head. Um, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, it just, maybe. Because, I mean, he, it could be some, I, I don't know. I mean, that's just something I'm throwing out there. And, you know, like when we were talking about the trees and the forests and I was saying that he seemed to be like creating a dead zone. I, what I kept thinking of about Bolshar, like anytime his mind came in uh, or his name came into my mind this episode, I kept thinking blight. You know, he's like a blight. Oh. Yeah, I mean, that that would be a good call, too. Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to see see, see where where they go. I say that all the time, but I'm not sorry about it. Um, no, I'm, I'm interested to see what happens with him, definitely. And, and I want to know a little bit more about his powers and stuff. Since it is very weird. You know I'm here for a villain. <laughs> Show me what he can do. Mm -hmm. I also, I was wondering, it seems to have just been Bolshar testing Winona, in a way. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. So, it should be, you know, kind of trying to get a handle on this, this air, especially mm -hmm. after finding out that she messed up the vampire's Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he you know, wanted to see what she could do. He was just playing with her and took out a member of the team. Yep. And wanted to see what she'd do and see who's vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So he got a lot of information about that uh, or from that exchange. He lost a demon in the process, but I, I doubt he's that upset about it. Yeah, I don't. He didn't seem too broken up. Yeah. I gotta say, when Dolls walked up and started shooting at the demon, I was ready for him to, like, disappear and for Dolls to shoot, like, Winona. Oh, ooh. And I guarantee you, it would have happened if anybody but Winona was standing at the top of that hill. Or was top of yeah, that, like, maybe. cliff. It, like, I was just waiting for it to happen, like, as I was watching. Mm-hmm. Can can we talk about Nicole telling Winona to be smart and let go of the rope before they both go over? Yeah, you can. Because that was, like... I love them both, and I like how it's just, like, Nicole's like, you know, let go, be, you know, be smart, you know, do, you know, save yourself, like, make sure, because you're the heir, you're more important. I mean, that was why Nicole, that was part of why Nicole didn't want her to go down and get the Peacemaker. Mm -hmm. because Wino is the heir. But I just like how Wino is like, nope, 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 not letting you go. <laughs> not happening. And of course, Waverly just hobbled over just in time to save her girl. But thank God for Wino's quick thinking and quick reacting to grab that rope the second it got cut. Word. So I don't know. It looked like it was possible that Nicole was going to fan fall on that nice little, you know, platform that Wino landed on. Tiny ledge, maybe. Yeah, Little shelf, I, I guess. I just had to mention it. That was a lot of what I had with the exception of my I have questions section. I have questions? Yeah, I started making an I have questions section, which was also an excuse for me to discuss retconning. Oh, I gotcha. Well, I think I want to, like, before we, like, yeah. move on to that, I want to give, I want to give Melanie props Yes. I thought, you know, in that last scene with dolls, you know, again, I can I can think that there's a representation problem, and I cannot like how I, I cannot like that, uh, you know, uh, that dolls was killed, and I can, you know, um, I can have problems with, you know, the way that that was executed, but uh, I will say that, you know, I thought Melanie. Yeah, I, I thought Melanie acted the heck out of that scene. I really did. She, she did. Yeah, I mean, I was emotional. Like I said, I kind of, I, I well, there's no kind of about it. I didn't believe it was happening, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I was just like, what? Like, no, like this. And she, yeah, I mean, every, you know, her, you know, I'm not leaving him. He hates the woods, everything. It was mm -hmm. grief stricken and, you know, yeah, I, just, I think she did a, a really great job with that scene. Yeah, and I think that's another good hallucinatory Michelle moment, that final moment there with um, Winona kind of yeah. comforting herself. Yeah, sorry. I don't know why I didn't have that as a note, because I think I meant it to... I don't know. Sometimes it's hard, guys. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Melanie acted the hell out of it like she always does. Yeah, she did. 
but yeah, I had a couple of, uh, a couple of like, you know, little retconny things. And I did want to mention, I have now said the word like three times. Um, and I used the word retcon in our last episode and a friend kindly pointed out that I should define it just in case someone doesn't know what it means. So really quick retcon short for retroactive continuity is a revision of an established story, basically. So uh, we've kind of given context on it, but yeah, anything that's that's an established canon thing that later gets changed in canon as well. Mm -hmm. So that's retconning for you. But mostly I have three notes, two notes here that are talking about we talked about this last episode, and I'm going to keep bringing it up, because three times the word prison was used to talk about where Michelle was being held. And, like, I get what Emily said about, you know, Michelle being institutionalized, but prison. I, Winona tells Michelle she can't be there because she's in prison. When mm -hmm. Michelle's looking behind her, and Winona points it out, you know, and was doing it in the prison, Michelle tells her, you know, like, it's odd to be on edge in prison. So I need to point that out for my own nitpicky nonsense. But yeah, I just keep telling me it's a prison if it's not. It's kind of where I'm at with that. Gotcha. Also, I thought Doc knew that Dolls was, or sorry, ugh. I thought Doc knew that Jeremy was working on Dolls' drugs. Like, it was in the episode last week that Doc came downstairs and found Jeremy tweaking Dolls' drugs. Hmm. And I want to know what exactly, like, we've focused on the serum twice in the episode, and I, I, I mentioned it already, but, like, I really want to know if it's the serum that's causing problems, or what? Because it is a different color. Um, a slightly different color. Like, it's a slightly different shade of purple. And I, so I just, I had a question about that. And then the Revenant, like, walks in talks about smelling Waverly's fear, like when Wynona, after Winona gets to the cabin and tries to like talk to her and then has to rush upstairs yeah. because the Rev was coming in. Um, you know, he talks about how he smells Waverly's fear and stuff like that, which is also just a creepy thing to say anybody. Um, but did he genuinely not know that Winona was in the cabin or was he trying to lure them out like into a false sense of security? Because that was weird. Yeah. Those were all the things I had a lot of questions about. I don't have answers. Why not? That would make things so much easier if you I had know, answers. I know, but I don't. How dare you? Sorry. How you know dare. what? You know what I do have? Quotes? Quotes. That would have been embarrassing if I was wrong. <laughs> no, I didn't take any. <laughs> right. <laughs> I have a lot of Winona quotes. Probably because, you know, she talked most of the episode. Yeah, she did. I really love her God, I hate hangovers. Mm -hmm. And I love hallucinatory moms, like, right after that. Like, you are stuck on the side of a cliff. Yeah. I like, um, you know, shit hurts worse than when I pushed a baby from my hoo-ha on top of an eight ball. Yeah. I really love, it's not the fall that's going to kill you, it's the fear. Yeah. And then I liked her fall, like, because that's, you know, that's a, that was a good bang, and the, but I liked Winona's follow-up with pointy rocks at the bottom might help fear out, though. Yeah. <laughs> and then what kind of savage does this for fun after climbing up the cliff? And of course we know that Nicole is the type of person who does that for fun. <laughs> yeah. I liked Waverly's, I don't like being treated like a meat ornament. Yeah, I think I, I, for some reason, I didn't write that one down. I think because I was like, I gotta back down off writing the quotes because I had so many in the beginning. Oh, and then I like, remember what you said, Mama, it's the fear that kills you. And so Michelle's like, sometimes it's a demon. <laughs> yeah. It's just some kind of crazy little mermaid shit. Yes. I liked um, Nicole's woman kept her pregnancy on the download for months. What other new secrets could she have? Yes. For some reason, I didn't write that one down either. What was wrong with me? I, and I like the, we mentioned the charades. I had that on my list. Um, why known as three cheers for Kegels as she's jumping to get to Waverly's cage. I think my uh, favorite this episode goes to Jeremy. 
It's, look, I'm like a really smart shark. I can't stop the super brain for a second. Because yeah. anybody who knows me knows I love sharks, so. Yeah. Oh, and Doc asking, you don't trust Wynonna's instincts? I helped her kill a revenant she had sex with. <laughs> From the coal. <laughs> and Doc's like, let me rephrase. <laughs> I like how he just kind of is like, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll give you that one. Yeah. I also really liked Jeremy's, so you've lost your immortality. whoop de frickin do Because I feel like I'm probably going to say that <laughs> to, to Doc a few times this season. I like how he started off really strong and confident, and then Doc pulled out his gun, and he was like, oh, nope, nope, I'm going to back down. <laughs> yeah, he did back down real fast. Yeah. We mentioned this one, too. I'm gonna, I am gonna. I swear on my favorite boy band, I'm going to kill him, and then I'm going to bop right back. <laughs> yeah. It was just so great. Because I missed that the first two rewatches, I think. I think I only caught it on my last one. And Wynona's, you're a grown woman with the figure of a tiny Amazon. I get it. Mm-hmm. That's a good one. Um, we talked about, you know, Waverly's good. She's good. I killed the bad guy, as you do. And now I'm just doing some thinking and having some me time. Yeah. Uh, I hate to break yeah. it to you, but he is risen. Oh, yeah. I, I like the exchange with Wynona, Doc, and Nicole. Um, with the, I mentioned this one a little bit too, but, you know, I should be doing this going to get Peacemaker. Or me. Oh, did one of you guys have a harness in your car for impromptu weekend excursions? Yeah. No. I have nine years of climbing experience. You're the heir, and you can't even look over the edge. <laughs> and then I, I can be down and back before you can say redheads do it better. <laughs> that was my last one, was the redheads one. Yeah. I just had the whole thing because you know how I like to put huge chunks of dialogue in my class. I know you do. And we talked about he hates the woods. I'm not leaving here alone. Leaving him here alone. Mm -hmm. And I let, you know, Waverly, okay, okay, nobody's leaving him. And then the last one I had on my list was the exchange with uh, Michelle Winona and Waverly, where they go back and forth. I missed it. Um, again, on my first two rewatches, I missed it. Waverly and Michelle both say he's at peace now. When I first watched, I thought it was just Michelle. Because mm -hmm. her voice kind of, her voice is slightly louder than Waverly's. Yeah. So she kind of overshadows her a little bit. But yeah, I missed that. Um, so it was just kind of interesting how that went back once I kind of sat down and really listened to it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just the exchange with them telling why not she's got to let him go. So I think that was everything on my list. Mine too. I think with that. Uh, unless there's anything else you want to mention, anything else that popped into your head, anything? No, I think that's it for me. Alrighty. Then wrap this up. Um, so thank you everybody who stuck around and listened. For some reason, I have a problem remembering to plug things in the beginning of episodes. So you can check out my short recap. Um, my recaps are about a thousand words or less. So they're, they're short and don't encompass everything, but that's why we do the podcast. Um, so I have retweeted that on the Make Your Peace Twitter. And the Make Your Peace Twitter is uh, at 4ye underscore myp podcast. And you can find 4ye at uh, 4 underscore y underscore e or at 4ye.co.uk. And you can check out all of the things that Laura and I have written for the site. But also that is the number four. Um, and then you can find me at cmushaw on Twitter. And that's at c-m-e-u-s-h-a-w. And then where can they find you? You guys can find me on Twitter at R.S. Mayfair. And I just want to stress that if you're feeling upset about this episode or you just you want to talk to somebody, my DMs are open. Likewise, if you feel like there's, you know, something that I could have said better or said differently, uh, feel free to reach out to me. And the same goes for me as well. Um, the DMs for the podcast Twitter are open. Um, yeah, that's also fine. As our, like, mine are open as well. And like I said, I mean, like Laura said, and I want to echo that as well. Like, if there's something where you're like, eh, just let us know. Or, and like I said, we'll retweet stuff if you, if you're, you know, not a very loud voice in the fandom and, and kind of had thoughts um, or something like that. And, and we can help you guys get those out too. Yeah. 
So um, I think that's everything. So thank you guys so much for listening. Um, and we will see you next time. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.